All right, so today we're gonna to talk about account management. In other words, we're gonna talk about managing the digital identities of your users, starting from gathering information that makes up that user profile, how to store that information, what type of information is relevant, how do you deal with users that change departments, change their jobs, change their roles, gain more privileges and such. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on here, which is closely related to daily maintenance operations uh, when it comes to maintaining an identity and access management system. So let's see where does it all begin. And surprisingly enough, because this is still a security training, uh, the role of HR here is vital in account management and identity management, because that's when the actual digital identity is created within a company, when that person joins the company and HR provides the necessary information for their own account and the associated privileges and permissions that come with it. And the very first type of identity or profile that sometimes gets created inside of a company is the one created by HR even before the hiring process finishes. And that is the profile that is used to conduct the background checks, your previous employers, your previous activity. Basically what HR is doing at this point is very similar to open source intelligence reconnaissance phase <laughs> at the big, very beginning of an attack. So it uses whatever information has available publicly over the internet in order to determine more about your actual identity. After the hiring process finishes, well, the HR is going to take care of providing you with the set of credentials that you will be using from now on to interact with other services inside of a company. Now, this might be just a simple account creation, a digital account, or it might require you to get a hold of uh, some uh, some smart cards, maybe some USB keys that you will be using all over the all over the company. Assets such as mobile devices, laptops, any kind of devices that you might need to use for your job role also need to be provisioned and then given to you with the necessary accounts and permissions already configured within them. And of course, as part of your induction process, probably, you're going to have to go through some security trainings that make sure that you are security aware, at least as far as your job role is concerned, so that you're not going to increase the attack surface in your company and you will not present an additional risk to the entire security of the company. HR role doesn't end here. It also works as a centralized point for disseminating any kind of policy updates, security policy updates that might be implemented in the future. Their role is to make all the employees aware of any changes that might have been introduced in the meantime. And of course, the role of HR ends with the termination of the employee. I know it sounds drastical, but you know, when a person leaves a company, it's still called termination, even if we don't actually terminate <laughs> that, that employee. But again, the role of HR is going to be to handle the management of those credentials such as making sure that the IT department disables their user account. Uh, maybe uh, the IT department should store in some backup any keys or encrypted information that was generated by that user account so that in the future, if a forensic investigation perhaps needs to be performed, they will have something to work with and those uh, the, the files created by that user are not lost forever along with their credentials. That's why in most companies, uh, user identities, use digital identities are never completely deleted. They're just disabled when that user leaves the company. And also don't forget about retrieving any devices that the user might have received from the company uh, because the device belongs to the company, of course, but also because the information, the data stored on those devices uh, is probably confidential and protected by NDAs and is in some way or another some sort of intellectual property that needs to be protected. All right, next up we have personnel security which means the involvement of the employees within the company's security policy. And in order to gain something like this, there has to be some sort of a friendship <laughs> being uh, kindled between HR and the IT department, which is not always the easiest thing to do. And the purpose behind these policies involving employees is to avoid situations where one employee might abuse their privileges in order to perform unauthorized actions or to gain some personal advantage by using company resources. 
And we have a couple of policies here, starting with separation of duties. Exactly what the name says, it's sharing responsibility among multiple people so that no single individual can abuse the power that it has been given to them. As you can see, this is a method of trying at least to avoid the potential risk of insider threats. Implementing this requires each and every individual to know exactly what their job role is and how they should be performing that job role. Normally, this type of description is written in a document called SOP or Standard Operating Procedure. And as long as nobody derails from that SOP, uh, everything should be fine. I mean, everybody should be doing their own job and no individual user should have authority in excess. Another technique that can be implemented right here is an approval process. One person initiates an action, wants to do something, and then that action first needs to be approved by somebody higher in the hierarchy, or sometimes even by equal peers in the same team. Least privilege is a very well-known principle in security, and it doesn't just apply to people and personnel, it also applies to programs, services, applications running over the network, pieces of code that get executed. And what it says is that at least when it comes to personnel and people doing their job, each and every individual should have sufficient rights and permissions to do their own job, but no more than that. This is to avoid on one hand privilege abuse, and on the other to avoid situations when an account gets compromised by an attacker, and that attacker might gain surprisingly high privileges <laughs> simply by compromising that account. Least privilege should also be managed inside of the company security policy whenever people change roles or change jobs because it, it happens more often than not that a, a person who switches departments gains the permissions and the privileges associated with the new department but still retains all those permissions from the old department because nobody is concerned anymore about those historical privileges and policy assignments. That's why in many companies, people who have been in there for 10, 15 years or so and have switched a lot of departments, they're kind of like super users in there, <laughs> mini gods, if you wish. They have access to so many resources, they can do so much stuff in that network simply because they have retained all the privileges and all the access that they have gained over the years. So least privilege helps us avoid the situation called, by the way, privilege creep. Job rotation, again, against insider threats and collusion and abuse of privilege means that one person should not hold the same job for an unlimited amount of time. One advantage of doing this is that knowledge isn't now constrained to a single individual or to just a bunch of people, can be freely shared among a team, and also lowers the chances that a certain individual is going to abuse their privileges in a certain position. Maybe they've discovered some backdoors, maybe they've discovered some methods to bypass company policy, and uh, they're never going to be caught because nobody else ever looks over their shoulder and nobody else ever takes over their job. And that's also one of the reasons behind mandatory vacation. Go, step away from your, from your office for, for two weeks or so, so that somebody else can step in, do your job, because this also makes it that much harder for the original person to hide any malicious activity that they might have been running around in that unsupervised job. And also from a management perspective, you know, <laughs> having somebody else step in and take over uh, another employee's job might also reveal some inconsistencies or even the fact that, God forbid, that original person wasn't doing their job properly. <laughs> well, all good things come to an end. Or in the case of uh, resignations, perhaps not all good things, but also bad things come to an end. <laughs> which means that we're also going to have an offboarding policy. So what happens when an employee leaves a company? From a security perspective, first off, we need to take care of the accounts that the user has been using, uh, even including shared accounts. Those are a bit difficult because if you can simply disable a user account, if there's an account that was uh, shared among multiple team members, for example, you cannot just disable that account, right? Because everybody else loses access. So what do you do? If, uh, if one of the team members suddenly leaves, well, do you change the password and let everybody know? Or how about not using shared accounts in the first place? Carefully with user encrypted data. 
as we said before, users have the ability to request certificates to use those certificates to encrypt files on the disk, even entire disk drives using BitLocker, for example. Well, what do you do if sometime in the future you need to perform an investigation or you discover some malicious activity that the user was involved in and you have no way of accessing that encrypted data? There are situations where this can be mitigated, such as keeping the private keys generated for that user uh, in key escrow like a backup database of private keys, just in case sometime in the future you will need to access the data owned by the user who has long left the company. Luckily, Windows Domain Controllers also have the ability of automatically storing these keys in key escrow in a key backup database specifically for that reason. And also don't forget about the actual physical assets, laptops, mobile phones, tablets, any kind of electronic devices that can store data or that can be used to gain access into the company or into the company's network, make sure you get a hold of them. And ideally, those devices should not be clonable. You should be pretty sure that the user doesn't have a backup copy of the data that can still offer them access to confidential information in your company. Now, don't forget that even though you might be following all these procedures closely, and checking every requirement in here, there is still a potential risk because a person who's leaving the company might have had deep detailed knowledge of the security systems in that company, of how the network works, of how the what applications they're running in there, um, how old they are, what vulnerabilities they have. So there's never a zero risk from somebody who's leaving the company, especially if they had privileged access. So what are the types of accounts that we can find in an enterprise environment or an enterprise network? We're going to start with generic users, just like you and me, right? <laughs> They're not able to change any security policy, right? They are just meant to obey those security policies, to play by the rules. And of course, this is one place where we should definitely always apply the principle of least privilege. Of course, according to each user's own job role and requirements. We also have guest accounts, uh, pretty dangerous ones. These are the accounts that anybody can use even without a password or with a default shared password. They do come with a lot of security risks because there's no way to track down the activity to a specific user, to know exactly who did what. This is also one of the reasons why this is uh, one of the places where definitely you should apply the principle of least privileges and probably the privileges that a guest account has they have to be even lower than the privileges that a normal user has. Almost next to none. The policy is probably going to be just uh, provides internet access or filtered, regulated internet access for guest users, but that's it. No other type of access to any other VLAN or any other network resources in your, in your network. And actually think about if you really need guest accounts, because you do have methods even for wireless guest access for providing users with temporary credentials or by using any other type of authentication mechanism that avoids the use of shared or guest accounts. So consider if it's not better if you just disable them altogether. The administrator or the root accounts, well, these are dangerous because these are the first target of an attack, always. So when an attacker attempts to penetrate a network to escalate their privileges to gain more access, they will be targeting these administrator accounts because these allow them unrestricted access all over the network. So make sure that the password policy, the security policies that apply to these accounts are bulletproof. And they're target not just because they allow attackers, or potential attackers to gain access everywhere over the network, but they also have the ability to change security policies. So if an attacker gets their hands on an admin account, they might even be clever enough not to use that admin account to perform their malicious activities, but to lower the security policies or to create additional users, perhaps, in order for them to interact with the network completely undetected, or even to erase their tracks after their malicious activities have been conducted. Next up, we have shared accounts, and these are the worst. <laughs> shared accounts are any accounts whose um, login credentials are known to a group of people, not just to any individual. And everybody uses the same account, which means that we also lose track of who is doing what. There's no identity information tied to that shared account. We don't know which of the 10 team members has performed an action because everybody uses the same account to log in. We also don't have non-repudiation. 
there's no such thing, right? Nor repudiation relies on some cryptographic uh, knowledge that can uniquely identify a single person. We don't have this with shared accounts. And don't just think that shared accounts are, you know, Joe from IT creates, uh, creates an account for him and then shares that account with somebody else. No, shared accounts can also be those default admin accounts that most appliances, network devices, applications come pre-configured, such as the login with the user admin and password admin123, right? That's also a shared account. And in many situations, many companies, people don't even change those default accounts and they don't even think about, well, let's create individual accounts at least so we have some uh, traceability in there. We can perform some sort of accounting as to who did what action. And there's one more problem with shared accounts. If a group of people know the same login credentials, then you have to find a way to securely distribute that login information to multiple people at the same time. You know, distribute a certificate or a password, which is not an easy thing to do. And the more people know that secret information, the less secure that information actually is. And speaking of those generic admin accounts, they are worth a separate category in here, actually. Generic admin accounts, pre-configured accounts that you can find in most network devices, applications, appliances that you install in your network. They're also a large target for attackers simply because a lot of companies, a lot of IT departments forget about them, or even, even worse, they start using them from the very beginning and they, and they stick with them simply because they don't really care about creating additional users and all the hassle that comes with additional identities and synchronization with an identity provider and creating security policies for each user. Yeah, what the heck? Just give the admin account to everyone and that's it, including the attacker. <laughs> Now, on the topic of assigning permissions or privileges, this is basically the policy that says what type of resources does a specific user have access to? What servers can it connect to? What type of URLs can they access? What type of applications can they log into? What type of file servers uh, can they access? And do they have read or write uh, permissions in there? So all these policies are basically the authorization part. What privileges you have after you have authenticated in a network system. So we have two ways of assigning these privileges. First of all, we can assign them per user. So when a new user comes into the company, perhaps HR discusses with the, uh, the manager of the user's department and they decide together, well, these are the resources that this user should have access to. Let's give him uh, access to this app and this app and this file server. And if they need access to something else, something more, they'll probably just create a ticket or a request when they actually need it. So that's not very efficient, especially in large companies. And also it's a security risk because this entire process has to be recreated every single time a new user comes into the company, not to mention when the user changes roles or when the user leaves the company. So a better solution to this is to rely on group-based policies. So instead of signing these permissions to users at a user level, we create groups or roles that closely match the actual job roles from real life inside the company. So let's say, for example, that we have developers, we have database admins, we have, uh, I don't know, security testers, penetration testers, so different teams, different roles. We create specific groups for them, and then we assign all the privileges to that group. Now, whenever a new employee comes into the company and the new employee needs to be um, assigned to the development team, for example, we simply add that user, that digital identity to the development group, and they automatically inherit all the permissions from that group. This makes user management much easier and also makes permissions management much easier because uh, we avoid a situation where a new user comes in and we forget to provide them with the necessary credentials or we even give them too many <laughs> permissions simply because we don't know exactly what they should have access to. Moving a user between departments also is made much easier. And also when a user leaves the company, it's just a matter of removing that user from all the groups and then disabling that digital identity. And by the way, there's no reason why a user cannot be a member of multiple groups. So if we need for that user to inherit permissions for multiple departments or for from multiple, uh, let's say, security levels, we can just as easily make it a member of multiple groups and all the permissions are going to be inherited and compiled into one single set of permissions that apply to that user specifically. And to give you a place to start, most operating systems do have some default security groups, such as the group called users 
in Windows as opposed to the group called administrators in Windows. You probably can guess what the difference between the permissions assigned to these two groups are. In Linux, well, pretty much everybody is the same type of user, but we have group membership in Linux as well, except for the part where the privilege escalation or the execution of privileged operations on a Linux machine can be done using pseudo privileges, super user do. So that's going to require in a Linux machine to add that user to the sudoers list or the sudoers file, which in many distributions is located in a simple file, just like everything else in Linux, in slash etsy slash sudoers. If your user ID or username is in there, then you are allowed to perform privileged operations. Speaking of operating systems, we also have different types of accounts depending on the operating system, starting with Windows. On Windows, we also have the notion of a service account or a so-called, or how I like to call them, machine accounts. These are accounts that are used by applications or by processes, by services running in the background on Windows and they cannot be used directly by a human user. They don't allow direct user interaction with, the, with them. But instead, we use them, for example, for a web server to be able to authenticate itself and to gain access to a backend database that they need in order to serve some website content. Some of these default service accounts start with system. This is the supreme ultimate account in Windows. So it has the most privileges and it can launch processes even before the user logs in. Again, a big target for attackers. Secondly, we have local service, which is very similar to a regular user account, except for the fact that it is being used by internal processes inside Windows, so it's a machine account, but they can only access local resources or network resources, but without any kind of authentication. So they don't have a network identity. That's why we also have the network service, which again, does inherit pretty much the same privileges as the normal user account, but it is able to present itself using authentication credentials as an account that can authenticate itself to services over the network. On Linux, things are a bit simpler due to the fact that every user in Linux looks pretty much the same. So user accounts and machine accounts or accounts used by demons or by background services, they look exactly the same with a single difference that in general, any type of service account in Linux will not allow an interactive shell from a user. So you're not able to log in as that user, if that user is supposed to be used by some internal application in Linux. In most cases, these users are created automatically as part of the package installation process. So whenever you install, I don't know, Apache, for example, as a web server, you're going to find that a new user called Apache or www-data is being created in your user list, but you're not able to log in as that user. Another important set of credentials, especially in the Linux world, are SSH keys. SSH stands for Secure Shell. And as you probably know already, SSH is a powerful protocol that can be used for a number of things. Most likely, you've heard of SSH as a method for securely connecting, remotely connecting to a resource over an unsecure network such as the internet, because it provides you with CLI access in a secure manner. We can also use SSH for performing file transfers. In that case, you'll probably be using a utility called SCP, that's secure copy, that uses the same methods behind the scene, just as SSH, but instead of transferring uh, CLI text commands and outputs, it's going to transfer binary data. And since we have the ability of transferring binary data, that kind of means that we can also extend the SSH protocol to allow us to tunnel encrypted traffic from one point to the next from one SSH client to an SSH server. So we can use SSH as a tunneling protocol. Now, the SSH authentication method in itself relies on two key pairs, and those in most cases are RSA, public-private key pairs. First of all, we have the server key pair, also known as the host key. Now, the server, whenever a client authenticates to it, the server is going to present its public key to that client and it is assumed that the client needs to evaluate that public key, validate it, and decide whether to accept it or not. If the client accepts that public key, then that public key is going to be used to encrypt any information that we need to send back to that server. Now, what we just described is basically 
the server's authentication process. This is where the server presents itself to the client and tries to prove its identity. We also need to present the user to the server as well, because, well, that's pretty much the authentication part that concerns the user when connecting over an SSH connection. So if a user needs to authenticate himself to an SSH server, then they need to first upload their public key into the SSH server's database. There's a local database of public keys in there, and that database works as a way for the SSH server to know which connection requests to accept. So if a connection request, if some encrypted traffic comes in from a private key that corresponds to one of those public keys that are already in the SSH server's cache, then that connection is going to be allowed. Also on the topic of more exotic uh, credentials that we need to manage, there are also credentials generated by online services such as API keys or API tokens or remote access keys depending on the terminology. Like for example, the keys that you're generating into a cloud console that allow you access to cloud resources. If you want to interact with the a cloud environment using an API or using an automation tool such as Ansible or Terraform, you will need to generate a set of API keys and then sign or send those keys along with each and every request that you're sending to the API endpoint of that cloud providers. Which basically means that those keys become kind of like the, the keys to the kingdom especially if there's a large infrastructure or many critical resources behind that API endpoint that your company uses on a daily basis. So make sure that the keys that allow you access to all the infrastructure that is hosted in some cloud environment are thoroughly kept secure and you have a strong security policy and you have user traceability and you have a strict access control method so that those keys are not going to become public knowledge. Now, an account policy is the actual policy document that describes what a user can or cannot do. And the digital identity to which an account policy is usually attached to is a set of digital information that makes up a user profile. And user profile is made up of a number of attributes, such as the full name, the department, their email address, maybe a unique identifier within the system, like a numerical ID. All that stuff makes up a user profile. Then the access policy is the actual set or access list of resources that the user has access to. Now these permissions can directly be assigned to the user or they can be inherited from any group memberships that the user might be a member of. In Windows, this type of privilege assignment is being performed through a group policy object or GPO. GPOs can be used to configure privileges for both users and groups in a Windows Active Directory system. Many account policies also include a password policy as well, such as the minimum requirements for the password length, the complexity of the password, how often it should be changed, if ever, and perhaps if the user is allowed to reuse any of the previous passwords whenever they change their password. Additional security controls can be implemented by enriching these access policies using location information, such as where is the user connecting from? Are they inside of the company premises in the main building? Are they within a branch? Are they located somewhere over the internet, connecting over a VPN connection perhaps? Or we can even correlate the IP address information from which the, uh, the user is connecting from to a geographic IP database in order to determine which region the user is physically located in, or in more cases than not, the actual country the user is located in. And since we can have location policies, we can also have time-based policies, such as the time of the day or the day of the week when the user is allowed to access specific resources, or even down to how long a specific connection event is supposed to last. Now, as you can guess, all this uh, privilege assignment business is not an easy one because you can easily make mistakes in here. You can either assign too many privileges to a user or to a group, which defeats the principle of least privilege, or you can assign too little privileges in an attempt to thoroughly secure your user access, which in turn is going to create frustration and a large amount of support tickets. So ideally, in an enterprise environment, you should have an auditing process for those security policies so that periodically you can validate from top to bottom, ideally in an automated manner, 
if all the policy assignments and the privilege assignments follow the best practices and the internal security policies of your company. This process is called privilege review and it should be run from time to time to better detect and potentially improve your security posture. Another type of audit that can be performed is the auditing of user activity. Now, as you can guess, this information can help us a lot when we're investigating a security breach or an abnormal behavior or a potential threat to our network. But there's also a downside to this because you might be tempted to log as much information as possible, which in turn is going to create so many events, so much information that it's going to be impossible to search or to store or to properly make sense of it. So be careful here, it's sometimes a form of an art to decide what is the exact sweet spot of what's useful for you to know, to record, to log, and what should be ignored. Generally, or as a best practice, you should probably log in at least every connection attempt. So every time a user attempts to connect to your system, you should generate an event for this, even failed attempts, because those might indicate potential attacks that are trying to break into your network. Of course, you should think about which resource access logs you're going to, you're going to keep. You probably don't want to record any type of file access that your users access all over the network, but you're probably going to want to record the access to privileged files on specific file servers or in specific network locations. Also, if you have the resources for processing this type of information and you have the ability to, to monitor the process creation on each and every machine in your network, this might also prove useful whenever you're trying to investigate where did the breach come from and where did a specific piece of malware uh, entered our network and who executed it first. Of course, any changes to policies and settings local to the machine or global for the entire network, of course, those should be logged as well, because normally only admins should have access to, uh, to those policies and only admins should have the ability to change them. Well, if at some point you figure out that somebody has tampered with those security policies, you should have a log, a, a proof of what happened, when it happened and who was the author. And of course, any privilege escalation. And I'm not talking about privilege escalation in a, in a hacking way, but in, uh, in any type of request for additional privileges, such as executing something as administrator on a Windows server or executing something with pseudo privileges on a Linux machine. And of course, as part of the identity management policy, you should have methods for managing when and how and under which circumstances you will disable either temporarily or permanently your user accounts. We should have a policy in place to disable accounts that we suspect for malicious activity. Definitely have a policy in place for disabling accounts for people who are no longer working for our company. Account expiration might be useful for contract work, for temporary access for a partner, maybe another company that needs temporary access to some specific resources. And account lockout should be part of an automated reaction or response in your security policy so that after a number of failed attempts, for example, after a number of failed passwords, a user is going to be locked out for a limited number of time or until the admin intervenes and unlocks that user account in order to avoid brute force attacks and any other type of password attacks that might try to break into your, uh, your user accounts. So thanks for watching, a lot of information in this chapter. If you like this, if you want to discuss some more, leave a comment in the comment section. And if you thought this was useful, then like and subscribe. Good luck in your studies and see you on the next video. Bye bye. Thank you.